Hello, viewers. Thank you once again for joining Alpha One Canada's 2015 Virtual Education Summit. My name is Duncan Lamb, and I'm your host. We're very happy to have our speaker here today, Chad McFedrin from the Investors Group. Chad will be talking to us about end-of-life planning. Chad, do you mind saying a few words to our viewers before we begin? Maybe share with us your experience and expertise? Absolutely. Thank you, Duncan, for having me, first of all. Um, I've been with Investors Group for approximately eight years now, and I'm very excited to, to develop a, a successful practice here. And I think I've done that through a kind eccentric model. Um, my building blocks started at uh, a very uh, fine Italian restaurant here in the city. And I was managed to work myself up from busboy to, to waiter to manager. And I think that gave me the, the foundation and the building blocks to have a successful career here. Um, why I think that is, is very simply, it, a lot of people in the financial realm have the vast knowledge to do the financial planning process, but they lack personal skills. And I truly think that the, the having both the science and the personal aspect behind it uh, aids to having a very sex, a successful career. Uh, my philosophy is, is very, very simple. Put clients in a better place uh, than they met you before. And, and that's, that's a very central uh, to, to the financial planning process is trust and, and having uh, trust not only in the client, but in myself as well. So I'm glad to be here, Duncan. Thanks, Chad. Thanks for introducing yourself. All right, Chad, we're here specifically to talk about end-of-life planning. What are your thoughts on it? Well, Duncan, before I talk about end-of-life planning, I think we need to start with what is a financial plan and, and, and how to develop one. And, and, and even before I start with that, I think that clients, they spend a lot of time on, on their health aspect. Getting a GP and traveling great distances and, and performing great tasks and waiting a lot of periods of time and things of that nature to look after their health. But sometimes I think they neglect their wealth. They don't spend enough time on it. They're not focused on it until something happens. And I think they need to start off with building a professional team. Building a professional team, first of all, this is, these are in no particular order, Duncan, but first of all, picking a, a, a lawyer that you can trust. Picking an accountant or a tax preparer that you can trust. And then finally picking a, a, a financial planner that you can trust. Those individuals, those sometimes work independently, also work in conjunction with each other to develop you the best financial plan. There's certain things that a lawyer can do that I can't do, and there's certain things that I can I can do and vice versa. Um, so it's it's very, very important in my eyes to develop a team of professionals that you not only can look up to and trust and in their guidance, but also that are pointing you in the right direction. Uh, I get a, a lot of questions on chat. That's easier said than done. Um, my suggestion is to use the referral process. Talk to friends and family and, and pick their brains up. They have an individual that they trust and, and is doing great work for them and then interview them. Um, obviously, the invention of the internet, you can you have research at the, the tip of your uh, fingertips. So please uh, research the individual, um, go on sites and, and, and see what other people are saying about them and develop a professional team to surround you. The next thing, obviously, Duncan, is, is, is developing a, a financial plan. And I'd like to focus on the four pillars, income, investments, wealth protection as an in insurance, and then estate planning. So you'll notice that a lot of people think that end of life planning happens at the end of your life. Quite contrary, I like to segment my client base into three segments. Uh, first of all, individuals just starting out, creating their wealth, individuals that have created their wealth and are nearing retirement, and then also individuals that are nearing the end of their life and are looking at estate planning. But estate planning happens in all three segments of those categories. We don't wait until your end of life to start an estate planning or end of life planning, if you will. We do that all along throughout the process. And developing a financial plan is not something that we can do overnight. It's an ever evolving process because your life is ever evolving. What you think your retirement or, or your, your end of life process is going to be when you're 20 is vastly different than when you're 60. 
so having a financial planner and having a lawyer and having an accountant there to walk you through all steps of your financial life okay is very important to me making sure uh, that we don't have a one-size-fits-all plan and this is where uh, talking into becoming uh, personable with clients i need to know what makes them tick what a retirement looks for one individual is vastly different than what a retirement looks for another individual so we need to make sure that our professionals know us and are developing plans specifically to us and making sure that all, all whilst our best interests are being served. So what you're saying is having a team of professionals work with you is the right place to start. But where does someone go from there in regards to end of life planning? It's a great question, Duncan. Uh, obviously, there's multitudes of uh, areas to start in, but I like to uh, suggest that my clients have basically three documents. Uh, they're going to need a lawyer for this. Again, you'll see that I draw back to a team of people a lot in my in my talks. Um, having a power of attorney. There's two different types of powers of attorney. Uh, the first power of attorney is it, it's through property. And a lot of people have a misconception of what property means. Uh, when I say the word property, a lot of people think of their edifice or their, their home or their cottage or, or land. Uh, property from a legal sense means anything that you own. So that it does encompass your investments, your bank accounts, uh, your RSPs, your RESPs, your TFSAs, uh, all of the realm of your investments and in anything that you own, including jewelry and things that are in your house. The second power of attorney is for personal care. And though uh, I'm not a health professional, I think it's very important that individuals have a personal care power of attorney. And the reason for that being is, uh, I've been uh, unfortunately involved in many situations where I've had to enact power of attorney, uh, not myself, but for, uh, in client size. And, and I think it gives peace of mind to the power of attorney themselves. So in a power of attorney document, Basically, there's two individuals, the individual that's being represented. OK, so the client uh, and the power of attorney. Now, again, attorney means uh, is, is sort of a couple of things. Most people think attorney would would mean a lawyer. Um, in this case, it doesn't mean a lawyer. It just means a representative. So that could be your brother. That could be your sister. That could be your your spouse. That could be your locker roommates, aunts, uncle, um, whomever you think you can trust if something were to happen and they would have to act on your behalf. So another way of saying power of attorney is also living will. So a lot of people will, will talk about living wills. That's essentially a power of attorney of attorney. So what what does that power of attorney do? In the sense of personal care, what they would do is you would document to a lawyer what you would want if something were to happen to incapacitate you either mentally or physically. So for instance, I mean, I. It, these are conversations that I don't usually like having with my clients, but they are a must, Duncan. Um, not every not every conversation that I have with my clients is how much money they're making. Unfortunately, we do have to have difficult conversations. And if if your advisor is not having difficult conversations with you, I, I implore you to, to, to seek other advice because it's not all about roses. OK, sometimes we do have to have difficult conversations. That being said, uh, a power of attorney for uh, personal care uh, for instance, if, if you were driving down the street and, and, and got into a car accident and became incapacitated, what are your views on whether or not you wanted to be have life extending, extend, extending measures? What would you do if, if, if you were in a coma you, or, or machines were breathing for you in, 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 such a, in such cases? What would you want to be done? Now, if you think of the attorney in that, in that position, Usually it's a family member or a friend. Psychology, again, would, would automatically make that individual think of sustaining your life at all costs. That's a human in nature. And at, when we put someone in a stressful nature, they're not going to always think rationally. So their automatic response is to put you into a situation to extend your life as long as possible. That may not be what you want. So a power of attorney for personal care can put you in a position of having the attorney do what you want to be done. 
also, though it may not seem at the time to the attorney, a lot of the times I've, I've heard from uh, the powers of attorney that they'll tell me that after the fact, it's, it's given them peace of mind because they've been acted on the client's best interest. They've done what they wanted to do. And even though they may not have agreed with it at the time, Duncan, um, it, it, they have peace of mind that indeed it was what the client wanted. Obviously, the second power of attorney is, is power of attorney of property, as I, I touched on briefly. Power of attorney of property, there's two difference. There's non-continuing and continuing. Uh, non-continuing is if I wanted to, for, for instance, I was going overseas, okay, and I had to, I had no way of paying my bills and things of that nature. I was going on a trip to Africa or I was going on a trip uh, overseas and, and I didn't have a, a lot of connection to internet or, or email and things of that nature. Um, I can enact a power of attorney to look after my affairs whilst I'm gone. The second is continuing power of attorney, and that's probably the most popular. If I become incapacitated, either mentally or physically, and cannot perform the duties that I need to do on my physical or on my financial nature, then what I would do is uh, the power of attorney would enact and, and essentially be me. Now, there's limitations to a power of attorney. Uh, for instance, they cannot change beneficiaries. Um, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> we don't want them changing beneficiaries to themselves now, do we? Um, but in, in, in keeping on that, and I make a joke of that, uh, but a power of attorney could be a beneficiary in your will too. Uh, so it doesn't have to be outside. The next thing is having a power of attorney to act on your uh, on your financial interests means that if, again, if you become incapacitated, they can pay your bills. So if there's no gaps or you run in danger of, 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 of coming neglect on, on, on certain things. So uh, having both of those documents in place for a start is extremely, extremely important in my eyes. Obviously the third document is a will. And, and I'll touch briefly on, on a will, but I'd like to touch a little bit more of a power of attorneys. There's another popular way of, of a lot of people trying to circumvent the power of attorney by using joint accounts or joint tenancies. There's many ways of doing joint tenancy. I personally, though, again, there's no one size fits all picture. So it's very, very hard to talk about these things when I don't have a client in front of me with a specific case, because all of these are case by case specific details. But on a generality, I don't usually like to use joint tenancies for the reason for that is in joint tenants in common. So for instance, you had a bank account and that uh, you wanted your bills to continue to be paid if something happened. So you put your daughter or son on it. There's problems that can occur with that, i.e. they're half owners of the account. That means if they're going through a divorce or they're going through uh, financial troubles, um, you've exposed half of your assets to them. Um, and it could be, in, in, and I don't like to talk about this, um, but there's cases where, yes, the son or daughter uh, expropriated some funds from mom or dad. Um, it's not pleasant to talk about, but it does happen. Um, and, and a lot of people say, well, my son or daughter would never do that. And, and in most cases, they would. But having gen, uh, joint tenants in common a lot of times gives the other individual a little bit more power than we like them to have, okay? The second thing is a lot of uh, lawyers and accountants and, and financial planners will suggest joining tenants in common, i.e. in properties where there's a, a, a large amount of capital gains uh, tax associated. And, and why they do that is, is obviously to try to avoid taxes at the end of life. And though the, I'm a big proponent of avoiding taxes at the end of life, a lot of times what will happen to is uh, contrary to what I said, the previous problems of, of uh, either a divorce or, or bankruptcy, what tends to happen too, though, is if you don't do it properly, all you're doing is avoiding probate. Now, probate is an, uh, is, is, is become a nasty word, if you will. Uh, and the word probate is an actual a fee, not a tax. So in Canada, we do not have inheritance taxes. It's called probate. A probate is a fee okay that we have for a court to donate whether or not to designate whether or not that's the last will and testament okay so a lot of times when we're putting things into joint tenancy okay or joint tenants in common it's doing it to avoid probate 
and, and, and most in most jurisdictions, uh, depending on the province you're in, uh, probate is, is, is at tops in, in a million dollar case at tops uh, about two percent. OK, in most cases, one and a half percent. So though I would like to say one and a half or two percent, the problems that are associated with doing that sometimes outweigh the, the pros of actually doing it. So I, in, in most cases, I like my clients to have powers of attorney, both personal care and property. Now you've also mentioned wills and how important it is to have a proper will in place. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely, Duncan. Uh, that's the third document that I'd like to see my clients have, and it's very, very important in aiding you uh, for uh, end of life planning as well as estate planning. Essentially, what a will is is documenting what you would want done with your assets after the, your demise. I spend intricate amounts of time developing an end of life strategy or an estate planning uh, for my clients. And the last thing I want to do is all of that hard work to go by with the wayside, both for myself and for my client, by not having a properly documented will. Essentially, what I want to see in a will, my personal self, and though I don't do wills, obviously, again, you're going to need to seek a lawyer. Um, what I'd like to see in a, in a will is, first of all, we'll talk about, I'll digress a little bit, we'll talk about different types of wills. Most wills, in generality, are a his and hers will. So if you're married and you have a spouse, and most of the time, what will happen is if something happens to me, all of my assets would transform to my spouse. If something happens to my spouse, vice versa. There's also a, a contingentary beneficiary. Okay, if something happens to both of us, what we would like to happen to our assets? Okay, if there's children in place, obviously we want our children to have our assets in most cases. So I'll start with the three key components of a will. The first component is obviously the deceased or the client again. The second would be an executor. So in the, in the case of a power of attorney, you have an attorney that's going to act on, on behalf of the, the client. An executor is doing essentially the same thing, but for a deceased client. And then the beneficiaries. It is common that the executor is also a beneficiary. But there's also cases where the executor is not a, a beneficiary. For instance, I've just went through uh, one with my clients that uh, where the brother was the uh, was the executor and the children were the beneficiary of, uh, of the estate because he viewed the uh, the brother as a little bit no more knowledgeable and sometimes you don't want to cause any fights between siblings if you know what I'm getting at. Um, I do like to joke around, Duncan. By the way, uh, I know this information is a little bit dry, so I, I like to. Uh, to try to spruce it up a little bit. And 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 though I'm doing that, uh, everybody needs to, to realize that I, I am very serious when it comes down to, to my position. But having a properly documented will and having those three key components in those will, again, the client, the executor, and the in the uh, beneficiary. The executor's job, again, is to, to reflect what the client wants. So having the client document exactly what they would like is a key component to the will. There's, you can get as elaborate as you want in a will, or you can make it as simple as you want. For instance, uh, whatever assets I have goes to my wife, and whatever wife uh, assets my wife has comes to me. Obviously, two separate documents mirroring each other or a his and her will, or a mirrored will. Um, and if we do have children, everything that we have goes to the kids at the end. And simple as that. And the lawyer will stick in a book 18 paragraphs of, uh, uh, you know, lawyer, lawyer jargon, if you will, um, which is all important, by the way. Um, but that's as simple as, as it gets. There's also instances, though, if I have minor children, for instance, um, I'll, I'll paint you a little bit of a picture because I like to use stories and examples to tell to, to, to tell information. Um, husband and wife goes on a plane and goes on vacation. First vacation from from their kids, if you will. Um, ever. Their kids are four and five years old, so obviously minors. A minor in Canada is anybody under the age of 18 for a financial sense. Something happens and they both uh, perish, not in a plane crash, but they both perish on vacation. 
all of their assets were meant to be left to their children. They've in place the trustee, so an individual that's over the age of 18, okay, to act as the trustee of the individual, the, the, the children's money, whilst they are still minors. Nothing was in place after that. So basically, all it said was the money was go to the, to the children, and that uh, you know Joe Blow or, or Jane Doe is going to be the the the, uh, the trustee of, of said money until they become adults. Um, this particular uh, this particular estate was worth uh, three quarters of a million dollars, so a good chunk of change. Uh, once the individuals, the children, became age eight, eighteen. They dumped approximately a million or half a million dollars into each of their laps. There was growth on the estate once once they turned 18. Um, I don't know about you, Duncan, but putting a half a million dollars in an 18 year old's lap is probably not the wisest thing to do. Um, though there's 18 year olds out there that that, that are very responsible. Um, most of them, and and I can speak for myself, at 18, a half a million wouldn't probably go very far in my future. Um, your mindset at that age is obviously focused on, on on things other than investing, if you will. So um, getting as specific as you want in the will and stating that um, so much of your money can be used for education, so much could be used to buy a car to go to school, so much can be used for the first house, um, so much can be uh, used when they get married. You can make it as elaborate as you want, and I and I encourage you to do that to make sure that we're not dumping, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in 18 year old laps, if you will. Um, so it, that's the first part is getting a clearly documented will. OK, a lot of the times, obviously, lawyers are charged by an hour. Sorry, lawyers, uh, everybody charges by an hour and you're well worth your money. So I suggest that a, for a husband and wife, for instance, you sit down and discuss what you would want to happen to your money if you are no longer here. Now, I'm speaking a lot about families, um, but there's always, you know, single individuals out there or widowed individuals that, that don't have a spouse or don't have children. Those individuals may be leaving it to family members. OK, and those individuals also may be leaving it to uh, charities. Hint, hint, uh, uh, Alpha One. So uh, leaving a legacy, obviously, there's tax consequences and, and, and tax preferential treatments. I'm not going to get into this uh, today, Duncan, only because um, I could sit here for about four hours and talk about the tax consequences of uh, leaving it to, to each individual. I don't think we have that many uh, that much time on our hands. Um, again, seek professional help, seek a lawyer, seek uh, again an accountant and a financial planner to make sure that your what you're doing is is is, is on top notch, if you will. But I will touch on on, on doing a proper will and making sure that sometimes we're not handcuffing the executor. So the executor, again, is to re responsible to carry out your will. A lot of times uh, there's certain financial instruments, the instruments that we can leave a beneficiary for at the plan level. So for instance, uh, an RSP, a registered uh, savings plan. A lot of people, you can leave a beneficiary so a lot of people will leave the beneficiary at the plan level, such as a man level, and that monies will go directly to their beneficiaries and skip the will. A lot of that's done, again, to, to avoid the bad word there, probate. <laughs> um, unfortunately, sometimes, if not done properly, that can actually create a nightmare for the executor. What happens is an RSP goes directly to the beneficiaries and is taxed in the hand of, uh, of the client's estate. Unfortunately, if there's not enough money there to pay the taxes, the estate is in defunct or, 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 or bankrupt, if you will. So we need to be careful that we're not trying to skip probate at the detriment of the executor or the estate. So again, I can't stress enough that it's not a one size fits all platform. There's a lot of times where I suggest to my clients not to leave a beneficiary on, on, on the plan level, but let it go through the will. There's a lot of times where I say, you know, absolutely leave it as a, a beneficiary at the plan level and let your will take care of the rest. So again, it's not a one size fits all measure. And again, we need to seek professionals. 
I, I can't stress that enough. And it sounds like I'm, I'm doing a commercial for, for, for lawyers and accountants and, and tax preparers, but that's not the case. Um, I, I always use uh, the old adage, if you're two-third, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't go on the internet and research how to pull it out yourself. You go to a dentist. Okay, if your back hurts, you go to a chiropractor. Okay, if, if, if you're sick, you go to a GP and then he could possibly send you to a specialist. This is the, very much the same way. We can't be sitting here and trying to skimp out and, and researching on the internet and, and, and doing you know uh, wills that you can do yourself. Yes, the, the, those may hold up in court, yes or no. I, I'm not a lawyer again. However, um, is it done right? And if you've taken all of your life to accumulate your wealth, okay, don't you think that we need to spend a few minutes or a few hours with a professional trying to protect that? The most taxes usually that anybody will pay is at their last day of death or the last day of living. So CRA, the Canadian Revenue Agency, it will look at you as being dead the day before that you died. So they'll take an evaluation of all of your assets and what they were worth that day. Some are taxed, some are not. Okay, and they'll do an evaluation at that point in time. If if I sold everything at once, usually that's the biggest tax bill I'll ever pay in my life. So we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to our families and we owe it to our beneficiaries. I think to, to spend a lot of time and, 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 and iron out the details of this. And again, it can be very, very cumbersome, uh, Duncan, but if you seek out a professional and they guide you through this process, I think that you'll be very, very happy in the end. The last point that I, I, I would like to make, Duncan, is, is, is very simple. There is no need to wait to the end of our life to do end of life financial planning or estate planning. We should be doing it all well to our lives. And again, that financial plan will change and so will your estate plan change. Certain things become more important as we get older. And I think that uh, we owe it to ourselves to spend a little bit more time on looking at our finances than, than we typically do. Well, Chad, thank you very much. That is all very interesting. And I did learn a thing or two uh, from, that, from that talk we had just now. Well, on behalf of Alpha One Canada, I would like to thank Chad McFedron for taking his time to prepare and speak to our viewers. Please re remember to check out the rest of our 2015 Virtual Education Summit featured videos on our website, www.alpha1canada.ca. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.